everybody, thank you for coming and thank you to those who are watching on the live stream. Um, this is the Yes Bonnet Spotlight, I'm Marie Brennan. I'm going to start off with doing a brief reading. Um, and when I'm a guest bonnet at a time, I like to do a reading that is something which isn't available to the general public already because, you know, special event if you guys are coming here. Uh, so I'm actually going to be reading a bit from The Liar's Mouth, which is the second of the Rook and Rose books that I'm writing with my friend Elizabeth Powell's under the joint pen name of Emily Ferrick. Now, I know not everybody has necessarily read The Mask of Mirrors, which is the first of the books, so this selection is carefully chosen and in a couple of places carefully edited to avoid spoilers, uh, as we don't really need a lot of prior knowledge either. Uh, the background I will give you here is that uh, Ren, the main character, who is a con artist, at the end of the first book, by means I will not explain, acquired a magical disguise. And once she's in that disguise, uh, the persona is one people have taken from calling the Black Rose. Uh, that would be the Rose part of the Black Rose. Uh, she is currently working with a guy named Rossi Margo to try and capture uh, Shiji Bulavka, the woman who, for reasons that don't really matter, here, she needs to capture. Margo has no idea who the Black Rose is, so that's in front of and the last bit of background is just that uh, this is a colonized city, the Bosenians are the, the local inhabitants, and so to represent uh, the Bosenian characters here and also Renzo and Floss, which is half Bosenian, I will be doing my best to have any Slavic accent. I don't play that it's perfect, but it's a Bosenian accent, therefore it is whatever I say it is, right? <laughs> um, and so when you're really shifting into that, for Ren it's for Floss, but when she's speaking as the Black Rose, it's my normal accent. State's water was the forgotten part of Medesha. People looked at it all the time, whenever they had business with the shipping down river, or gazed past the masts crowding Turtle Lagoon to the buildings beyond. Though buildings might be more a courtesy term than anything else. State's water was a hodgepodge of boats and rafts and rickety houses on stilts, joined by planks and rope bridges until it hung together in something like a district. When people spoke of Medesha's reaches, they named the upper bank, the lower bank, and the Alliance. Never stayed for It was a relic, a poor and close packed reminder of what the Delta had looked like before the Denver sank stone foundations into the mud and built itself up into a city. It was the main bastion of the Strexville clan, and the fists of their various knots kept close watch on the bridges that bled from the rest of State's water to the area they controlled. Red had taken extra care with her makeup this time, painting herself to look not just old, but like a specific old woman. At night, with slow Kamalos' face, full face veiled by thick clouds, it was enough to pass. The guards nodded as she creeped her way across one of the connecting bridges with a snail bag of mending and piecework. One even stepped forward to help her shred a tire on her back. Once past them, she trotted her way onward through the cramped shanty town until she reached a gap in the structure. In between flowed the waters of the Dujera. Across the gap, a set of islands clung to a central building like barnacles to a ship. There, gratefully, she put the bag down and pulled its mouth open. Arkady had insisted she was too famous to just walk in like the rest of her beggar pack had done over the last few days. Now the girl wiggled out of the bag while Ren swung a clawed padded hook across the gap, trailing a coil of lightweight rope behind it. Once that was secure, a line of small children bearing lumpy, squirming bags emerged from nearby hiding places and began to monkey across. By the time the first of them touched down in the Strexco headquarters, Ren had moved on. Conveniently, she didn't even have to scrub off the old woman's guys. All she had to do was slide the lace mask down, and the Black Rose's costume formed itself around her. If Renata was a burden she couldn't put down, and Lorenzo was a reminder of pain, the Black Rose is her refuge from all that. Ren knew better than to put much stock in what the least by Mengeni had said about her being chosen. Believing too strongly in divine favor was the kind of thing that got a person killed. But putting on a mask made her feel strong, and sometimes even the illusion of that was enough. The Black Rose wasn't an orphan, wasn't a traitor, wasn't someone without a place to belong. She had a purpose. She was going to yank a thread out of the middle of Roddick's tapestry and see how much it unraveled. If the stress go fists were any good, any kind of dramatic move would get her stabbed first, questioned later. Ren found her solution in an unoccupied chair wedged into one corner of a small, uneven platform where three shanties came together. When trouble came to, be casual. She picked up a piece of cord and looped it around her fingers to play Dreamweaver's Nest until three tiny strips of came around the corner. Then she smiled at them, friendly but sharp. Easy, 
I trust you've heard me. I'm here to talk to talk with you. The reactions were exactly as she hoped. Startled and wary, but not immediately violent. The rumors about the Black Rose's connection to Ivar kept the fists respectful, though it didn't stop them from having her back for weapons while one of their group went to one of the others. Only when a hand rushed too close to the lake shielding her eyes did she pull back. You may not see the face, only the mask. When they were satisfied she was unarmed, they let her on. Crossing the single rope bridge that led to the home nest, Red saw no sign of Arthur or the others. The wind had picked up, which was all that it would. Its rush would cover any sounds they might make. Inside, the Strexo had mustered an impressive number of fists to receive her, but the usual swagger was tempered by uncertainty. She even saw a couple of people touch their brows in the set. Presently, their leader showed no such courtesy. He sat in a comfortable chair on the far side of the room with a one-eyed woman at his side. That would be should be the lobby. Rumor said she was trying to persuade her uncle to swear himself in his not to run, the way Sarah had done. Ren's eyes slid to his other side and her breath caught. She had missed her chance to follow Sarah in seven knots, but now here was Sarah's brother, Mazdas. His hawk like nose and white eyes were well described in the Lisa's list. If she could grab both Galatka and Mazdas. So you're the Black Rose we've heard so much about. Cosaday was a heavy set man with a balding pate, a full beard, and a gleam to his eye that said he was no fool despite his wide smile. Whom we all have to thank for saving our wells for And an indecipherable rumble from Golovka, the amusement left his face and voice. All of us, which is why I will listen to what you have to say. But I should warn you that listening is all I agree to. My niece and I may disagree in our philosophies, but we shrugged. Family is family. Many of the people watching bore more than a little resemblance to Crosnade. Large family was a blessing for the Senias, but especially for the Stretsko. Family was wealth, strength, power, and posterity. Red had achieved the words carefully. I could have seen not a philosophy, but a sacrilege. Shijin Gulaka endangered the wellspring of Ajarais, the holiest site in all of Rasa, the gift through which our goddess's blessings flow. She must answer for that. You're the tool of that killer's bastard bargain, the monster spat. I heard how a seven knots he rescued him. She turned a full game to him. You mean how I prevented another sacrilege, murder on a sacred path? My concern is with those who blaspheme against Alvarez and her children, not struggle to mid the streets. She returned her attention to Prasade. So I have Chagulata and Chagulata Taylor to me, and I'll see to it that this young estate drives Jeff Perry. What fairness had this young say? Gulaka asked. Not angry like Mazdas, sad, betrayed. They went up river and visit the desert once a year to get drunk on sacred Aja with their Lodanzi masters. They care nothing for the city or our people here. They've forgotten us as they forget enough. You will not disrespect our elders. Probably waited until Gulaka clamped her lips and nodded in grudging agreement. Then he turned his gaze on Ren. And you? What power have you over the DMSA that you can influence their judgment? I think you make claims you cannot support, Lady Rose. It is not my power to influence the matters, but not the Lazarites. Matza stood throwing his pipe to the floor. Then tell Lazarites to come and claim us. Ren never expected Kazade to agree to turn over his niece, but that had never been the point of coming here. I thought she could stall all night. Matza's challenge proved too good an opening to refuse. Spreading her hands as though the battle were beyond her control, she said, Perhaps you will meet your ancestor instead. On those words, a shrieking rain of rats descended, and one spitting mad of tongue. Shouts burst from the stress to rats fell from the ceiling. Many hit the floor, writing themselves to scurry around in a panicked phase, but some caught themselves mid fall, lay with claws hooking into braids and clothes and sometimes skin. Ren, out of the immediate scuffle, Cycled a lap as the cat added to the chaos. There were too many rats for one lone tom to handle. She stepped out of the cat's pouch as he stripped for the door. And wait, as the strips go tore the rats from their hair and coats and set them down with the care only their clan would show. And waited, as the rats leaked out through the gaps in the walls and the floor, or climbed back to the ceiling in the smoke hole through which Arthur had dumped them. And waited. Any kind of no 
any fucking time. She didn't know what had gone wrong, but the chaos was dying down, and her husband's attention was back on her. Extemporizing, she spread her arms again. Do you doubt me now? The children of the bat are known for their strong bonds, but those bonds are to all the settings. Even now, you are with the dance they woven into a single fabric. And of all plans, the stress should understand that you must find common ground on which to stand, or all of you will fall. Ren felt no divine presence. She hadn't even planned her words, much less her timing. But no sooner had the word fall left her mouth than the floor splintered into kindling. Not the whole thing, just the center of it, an area about three paces across. And I to drop a double handful of stress into the water and some of the rats with them. But a clever rat had more than one way out of his hole. Prosody whirled up from his seat and kicked something behind it, and the back wall swung down with a heavy crash, reaching across to the shaft on the far side of the water. He wasted no time in bolting, Gulakta and Damasus right behind him. Red swore. A running leaf got her enough of a grip on an overhead beam to sling herself across the gap, avoiding the remaining fists in the room. The wall was taking damage in the transition to its new life as a bridge and it bowed ominously beneath her feet as she sprinted across, but it held long enough for her to reach the far side. Up ahead, the trio had split. Prozade had read ignored. He wasn't the one she'd come for. But Gulagka and Masas ran down different walkways, and she couldn't follow them both. Gulagka was the cake. Damasus was the frosting. She went after Gulagka. Unfortunately, the Stretsko woman was fast on her feet, and she knew the war in space water far better than Ren did. Gulakta dodged around the corner. If she got properly out of sight, Ren would never find her. She put on a burst of speed. As she skidded around the corner, she heard a crash and a grunt of pain. Gulakta was sprawled flat on the walkway. Ren knelt on her back before she could rise and bound her hands with the cord from the dream weaver's nest, looping it so the woman couldn't just dribble through. Gulakta opened her mouth to shout, but Ren grabbed the rag and blotted it into her mouth and muffled her. That's what you get from fucking up veiled waters! Arpity sprang onto the walkway next to Ren. She twirled the sticker pole she used to trip the lava, nearly braining Ren with it. Did you see the hat? That was my idea. The chef had seen it. Glancing back the way she'd come, Ren made another snap decision to trust that Arpity Bones was as competent as she claimed. The cat was perfect. Can you get this under the stick? She won't go nowhere you don't want her to. Hey, Blinky, you know, I'm not listening, I'm sure. A sharp whistle brought several of Arpy's kids sliding down from the rooftops, while Arpy sat on Gulakta and directed the kids to carry them both. With her focus no longer fixed on Gulakta, Red heard the shouts echoing through space water. Barbara was taking advantage of the whole situation to lead a strike against the river pirates who'd been cutting into the smuggling business. From the sound of it, the fight was fierce. But the Black Rose wasn't here to help a lower back crime lord take out his enemies. Ren swarmed up the side of the shack and arrived on the roof to find a cloud cover thinning out, Pavel's light breaking through to a little late scene. A swift glance around her answer. If she followed the lock from this way, then the monsters would be on the rooftops himself, trying to stir the chaos below. Ren sprinted after him. The roofs were no more solid than a fallen wall had been, their moldy shingles and boards bent beneath her feet, threatening to send her back down to what passed for ground level. Demontos heard her coming and jumped left, changing course to some unseen target. No, you don't, Red thought, grim and exhilarated all at once. Compared with bureaucracy and her life of constant lies, there was something pure about this. She felt that like her feet had wings as she closed the gap between them. Then Demontos put his foot right through in someone's house, sinking up to the thigh. By the time he wrenched his leg free, Red was close enough to bring him down with a flying tackle. Now, and that, they rolled off the edge of the roof and hit the walkway below. Demonsus pushed in Red's fall as much as he could push in anything when the boards ripped free of their nails at the impact. She let go of him to clutch desperately at the remaining planks, the sluggish waters flowing just beneath the toes of her boots. She almost lost her grip at the feel of a hand on her hat, another on her ass. Red didn't have time to be offended before she heard Varuni's dispassionate command. Drop. With Varuni's strength guiding her, the boat barely dipped when Red touched down. Demasos didn't receive the same gentle treatment. Varini hauled him out of the water by his collar and tossed him to the center of the boat, where two of Argo's fists found him with ropes. At the far edge, a third man pulled him into hiding under the walkways. Which left them one short of the crew who should have been there. 
Where's Fargo? Bernie's not Fargo. Problem with the new Had to set it off manually. We're going to take them off now. Her gaze flipped back at one of the fists, the one who'd been responsible for making certain he described about, drifted into place with Logan Flora at the headquarters. You certainly don't want to swim for a bit, he'll probably forgive you, if he doesn't catch cold. Too late, who would side with the resignation of a dead man. In the shadows ahead, the pale blood was flashing toward them, picking up spray with every stroke. Unlike then, it seemed far to the swim. He caught hold of the boat's edge, then Marie's hand, and used them to roll into the bottom with a swamp and a groan. His trousers were black with river water, his coat and waistcoat discarded who knew where. The fine cambric of his shirt was all but transparent, plastered to his skin. Through it, Red could see the blurred lines of his strange tattoo. I get so much of a sniffle, you're all burning in the Nazium, Fargo growled. After another heavy breath, he pushed himself up to his feet, then looked down at the Nazis with a puzzled frown. That doesn't look like a lock up. Got too many eyes for one thing. The strips here were so generous, they gave me two, Ren said lightly. Her friends have the other. Am I leaving me to stare? Vargo nudged the Nazis with a stocking toe. His boots must have gone the way of his other clothes. You still got the lock to satisfy his younger say. And I can think of several ways to make use of this one. She wanted to refuse. His Yamate had asked her to not so too. Giving Margo a prisoner of his own had never been part of their deal. But Rand was in a boat full of Argus people, heading on river as fast as the oarsmen could row. And she didn't think he had enough reverence for the Black Rose to bow to her commands. Still, she couldn't show weakness either. She met Margo gaze steadily. Call it a loan. I'll come back later. Or a favor in return. Barbara smiled, her voice sickle. I forget to like us doing each other favors, Lady Rose. A shout interrupted them. Arpity and her crew, working three to an oar, drove stolen boat free from State's water. Arpity herself was still sitting on top of the log top, and she waved with the arm that wasn't holding a familiar compact. Where do you want this one delivered? <laughs> Quite quickly because nobody had tried to study this yet. 
And I, I particularly love the scientific process mm -hmm. way he handled it. Um, so do you have um, specific places in mind? So I, I know you're really big at anthropological <laughs> um, Do you have certain places in mind and how they approach science? When you go into it, so like the first book, we went into a place that is rather backwards, mm -hmm. not a lot of technology, not a lot of exploration, mm -hmm. um, and then we have you know this crew coming in trying to study a dragon. Mm -hmm. So were there specific places in mind with their cultures that you had in place and then inserted that level of science? Uh, I mean, I wasn't looking because they're written as memoirs. It's all very much filtered through Isabella's point of view, and so there's relatively little of what is the kind of state of science and scientific mentality, uh, where she's going. What actually drove my decision to, to go to particular places uh, was a lot more of the environment, because I wanted to get a broad range of types of landscape that I could put her in, because you could have different types of dragons there, and then you know make her suffer different kinds of diseases and such there. My sister gets me great for the number of diseases I've inflicted on my characters. Um, and then, you know, having chosen an environment, it was, okay, what, is, like you said, this is very clearly modeled on Earth, so it's, all right, if I'm going for, like, a tropical, African jungle kind of thing, all right, let me go read about, like, the Luthi kidneys and such, or reading about West Africa, except where she starts off, so uh, reading up on, like, Mali or something, and places like that. Uh, so, it kind of like environment, okay, who are the people, and then from there. Um, and then why did you choose a the scientific approach mm -hmm. to exploring the dragons as opposed to, you know, um, social interaction? Yeah, which just, I mean, I am more of an anthropologist, I'm not a biologist, I'm very pleased that I'm prepared to think it well enough to, you know, satisfy people who are actual biologists. Um, it was really just, that's where the inspiration came from, it was two things. Um, I never read the book Dragonology, but I had like a wall calendar for a couple of years, and that presents itself as like a field guide to different sorts of dragons around the world. And then there is a third edition Dungeon Dragon source book called the Dragon Autocon, which, I mean, it does have like new spells, new magic items, new prestige classes, which is what a DD book does. But it also had things about like the life cycle of dragons, and like dragon graveyards, and skeletal drawings of dragons, which was top of Lockwood's artwork. And, that, that, you know, the fact that he did the covers and the interior art just brought everything full circle. Uh, but yeah, it meant that I really kind of was already trying to look at it from a, what if we study the biology of dragons, which then meant I wanted to make them animals rather than like sentient magical creatures, because that point it's more anthropology. And that just wasn't a sin I felt like there wasn't a sin that had kind of been planted in my head. Yeah. Um, what is your process like? So, where do you, where do your ideas come from? Uh, it frequently comes that, like, I, I often get asked the question in the form of, which comes first for you, character or plot, and, like, world? Uh, <laughs> I, I come at it from a third direction entirely. Though it's a bit hard to separate those out because, for me, the plot and the character are so enmeshed with the setting that it's like, the idea I have for the world comes with a character who's in a particular position or I want to write about a particular type of character which implies a certain set of around it or whatever. Uh, so yeah, those things are very intertwined. Um, and then I tend to be more on uh, what various media gets called, uh, if you want to be dignified, a discovery writer, if you want to be less dignified, a cancer, as in flying by the seatbelt. Uh, I, with some exceptions, I mostly don't have like an outline of the book before I start writing or anything like that. The main exception is actually uh, the Rick and Rose books that I'm writing in the list because, number one, collaboration, which means that whole, look at this vaguely evolving cloud of story stuff in my head and I find my way through that it doesn't work when there's two literal heads involved, at least not telepathic to see that. So we have to talk and plan a lot more. And those books are just a layer cake of intrigue and politics and deception and characters having different personas and there was one part where I actually had to go through the first book and make like a chart of which character knows what, which persona of theirs were they in when they learned it and therefore who can they admit to knowing it because they don't want that to bleed over and somebody goes, wait, how did you know about that? Oh crap, the whole comic world, all right. And tracing that out 
there was no way we could have written those books just kind of going, let's make it up as we go along. We could have titled ourselves with our own webs and fall apart on our faces. <laughs> All right. What is your most used procrastination technique? Oh. <laughs> <laughs> there are so many to choose from. There's a certain amount of, uh, you know, the, the house is never cleaner than what I'm trying to put off. You know, something you could have more vision though, rather than the actual drafting. Um, honestly, I mean, I'm all just kind of like further time away, you know, playing stupid mobile games on my phone or something. Uh, like, that's not even a procrastination technique so much as just what inertia looks like. <laughs> <laughs> all right, so um, content for me. All right, so um, the Onyx series. Mm -hmm. um, if for those of you that haven't read it, um, this time it's got a more historical based setting. It is um, 16th century London, uh, the court of Elizabeth I. So now you're caught up, which is the case. Um, how much research was involved? Oh, well. <laughs> well, and so actually, it's a little worse than that description applies because there's four books in the Alex Court series, and each one takes place in a different century. So every book, I'm like, okay. I had to learn London all over again. Here we go. I only sound like okay when I call it my own PhD in English history. Um, basically, if you go to my website, I've got pages for each book, and then um, on the side, if you're on the desktop or down at the bottom, if you're on mobile, there's like extra things associated with the book. And each one of those novels has a page for the research where I list the books that I read and consulted in the course of writing that book. So if you want to know how much research I did, it's all there, and you can see it getting longer with every book. Probably the worst one was The Act is Wild, which is the second one, because I wrote it I never taught in the first book in the field of Stephen Curry, with the idea that it was a standalone. And then somebody asked me a question about the Victorian period that made me come up with an idea for a Victorian era novel. And I actually sort of had a concept for two that would go in between, but initially I thought, all right, let me, like, I'll write the Victorian one, and then if this is going well, I'll go back to the other two. And about three months into doing the research for uh, what they inspired for Shorty Book, I decided I'd really get off more than I could chew in the time available, and it would be better for me to actually back up and do those books in between. And funny joke, that meant I had about three months in which to learn about the English Civil War. <laughs> Talk about how you got more than you could chew. Um, that research was a little bit miserable because I had half the usual time to do it in. It was a stupidly complex period of history. And frankly, by the end of it, by feeling for all the parties involved in that one screwy and the horse he rode in on, <laughs> <laughs> like, I, I maybe like, you know, I, I like democracy, but uh, it's really hard to decide with the people on the parliament the period side when they're doing things like, let's arrest the people who voted the way we don't want them to, and then hold that vote again. And, like, you're kind of letting outside of the democracy there, people. Uh, so that, that was an undertaking. <laughs> Was it difficult to weave the faith into those periods? It, it was and it wasn't because my uh, kind of most outline for those books is very much secret history rather than ultimate history. So the faith exists, but people don't widely know about them. And I did everything I could to keep the actual known history in exactly the shape and details that it was and then slip them into the press. Some places that's easy to do. Um, like I did not have a problem, one thing that comes up early on is the Spanish Armada that got destroyed when it was trying to invade England. Um, part of that was driven by human action, that like Sir Francis Drake had actually uh, attacked the Spanish fort and burned all of the like seasoned wood for barrel stakes, which meant that the food and drink for the Armada was put in casks that hadn't been properly seasoned, so everything was spoiled. Um, so like things like that, humans did it, I'm not allowed to take that away from them. But there were also these just hideous storms that like came out of nowhere and sank a huge portion of the Armada. I'm like, well that, well that, I can say my fair and promptly, but let's go. Um, so I was always looking for those places to slide it into the cracks, and it's not that I suppose were easier to find than others. <laughs> I'm not writing an American version of that series. Okay. Was it that all? Yeah. Um, yeah. Right? I, it was a hurricane in Washington, D.C. How often does that happen? Never. How often does that happen when the English are setting fire to the White House? Yeah. I mean, yeah. yeah. Come on. Whether or not it's not, I mean, the county house I had to find in Japan, I think it's an awful fleet. Like, 
There are numerous instances of history of suspiciously low tide storms. Is that Mother Nature not as intense? No. She's not as neutral as Switzerland. All right, so <laughs> what's your favorite unappreciated book? Oh. So the one that comes to mind, I, I'm not sure that unappreciated is quite the right word because if you go digging in the right corners of science fiction and fantasy, you will find a lot of people who are influenced by this. But there is a historical fiction series by a writer named Dorothy Dyer that's called The Lion Chronicles. And the first book is The Game of Kings, not to be confused with Game of Thrones, I wrote our Martin. Uh, it's historical uh, fiction set, it starts off with like English and Scottish border politics, but it's in the 16th century, and so you can't talk about that without bringing in France, and then the next thing you know, you're talking about the Ottomans, and then it will fight in Russia, so it starts out. But Dunnett is basically the only author I've ever read who just makes me feel actively inferior. <laughs> I read the books, I'm like, I'm, I've never been enough to that, like, ever. And so I have to kind of ration when I read them because otherwise I don't get my work done for the day. <laughs> they are really amazing. Uh, you can see a little bit in kind of the, the dynamics of the sort of central family that uh, Dunnett was influenced by Dorothy Sayers and Peter Lindsay books. And they had authors like Shirley Swift and Mary Dorothy Russell, and there's actually quite a few people, uh, Ellen Kushner, uh, quite a few people who were influenced by those books, but they deserve to be more widely known. And they've actually just been reissued, so they're much more available again. Reissued, yeah. All right, what has been the hardest scene for you to write? Oh, well, um, there's different kinds of work. Because uh, some of them are like a, oh, this is really tricky and delicate and I have to balance it correctly hard. And then there are the ones that are the, well, let me just, you know, salt that open wound I put in my heart kind of hard. Um, one of us kind of both, actually, uh, I can't go into detail because this is from The Liar's Not, so the book is not out yet, and I want to also give spoilers for The Mask of Mirrors. Uh, but there was a conversation that Alyssa and I had to write in that book where, like, it needs to be really like bad and hurtful and people saying the wrong things but then managing to like navigate their way through that to things actually working out in the long run. And we had to take like four months of that scene before we got it right. Like we, we started writing, we scrapped it, we started writing our own, we scrapped it. Um, and even when we got the version that pretty much worked, there was one bit that like in the, the kind of point on which everything was gonna like pivot and it needed to work, and we kept on coming up with things, it's like, yeah, that's, that's not getting the reaction that we needed to have here. And then this is what frequently happens when we're collaborating on uh, it. In this case, it was always, who was like, oh wait, how about this type of thing? And I was like, oh, yeah, yeah, that right there. So we get those reactions out of each other, we're going to work on something good. <laughs> so. All right, content warning. All right, so um, The Legend of the Five Rings. Mm -hmm. um, how did you, how did you manage to write the novel in that last world. Um, so it's a, a bit of a uh, kind of strangely winding path. Um, I got recruited to play in a tabletop game of Legend of the Five Rings by a friend of mine. So I'm playing that at a point when the company that used to own the game, uh, AEG, um, they phrased it like as a contest, but basically it was an open submission call for people to write a chapter for one of the upcoming source books. That is uh, Imperial Mysteries 2. And I'm like, okay write about you know, some period of the history of Rokugan, you know, send in your submissions. And I sent in two, uh, one of which was inspired by some comments they made in a sidebar in the first Imperial History book, and that ended up getting accepted. So I wrote the chapter of the Kobashi Dynasty, which is basically what if a different one of the Kami Kami had become the first emperor of Rokugan, how does that change things? So I wrote that. And then I ended up writing some more affordable playing game books, uh, basically through the end of fourth edition. Game gets sold off to a new company, Fantasy Flight Games. Um, and I actually, it, it was sort of a mark of like how I kind of grew in my career that I was very shameless in just like chasing after them going, Brian, right, you'd like to get anybody to write some stuff for you? I am here. Uh, in particular, because one thing about Alpine Bar uh, that has just came to an end is it's always had this ongoing storyline along with it, like these published fictions that further kind of the canon story uh, for the card game and the role play game. And that was what I really wanted to be writing in fiction. Um, only I found out very near the end of AEG's tenure, I, I got an opportunity to apply for the story team. And I started asking some questions, and I found out that they paid in parts for the game. 
No, thank you. Sorry. Especially because apparently the crime that you sell that card, so like really you weren't allowed to make money off of this. Fantasy Flight, on the other hand, was paying its authors, so I managed to talk my way into writing the short stories that are far beyond the storyline. A little way into this, uh, they started doing novellas for each of the plans, so I sent them a pitch for a dragon plan novella, because I've mostly been writing the dragon plan. And that got accepted, so I wrote the Eternal Monarch. And then they partnered with At Night Books, which is the publisher for the Night Prairie of the Demons uh, novel. And they contacted me saying, hey, we're starting out some L5R novels, would you like to write one? And I was like, yeah, yes, I would. I mean, I mean, I write short stories now, but I've always been a novelist at heart. Okay. Um, so then, uh, oh, yeah, go back all the way to the end. Oh, yeah. <laughs> Where did you get that idea? Um, y'all literally, it, right? uh, these are my first two published novels. Um, I, I they came from the smallest seeds possible. Um, one is that I, the, the movie The Truman Show, there's a bit where, like, he runs into these characters who are twins or something, and he makes a crack about doppelganger special. And I thought, doppelganger, that's a cool word. That should be the title of something. And then the musical later from, um, the, I think it's like the beginning of Act 2, uh, one of the bunch of characters was saying that one of them called another one a crazy bloody witch. And this kind of made me go, you know, you've got lots of like mages and fantasy and like sorcerers and sorceresses and like enchantresses. We don't hear the word witch that often in fantasy. And so literally I had the word witch and the word novel together, and that was the spirit. That is where it came from. I love the whole concept of the, um, the twin flame, y'all know what I'm talking about that, um, the mythos that every person is born with, you know, the equal and opposite, and then it gets split. So I was kind of addicted to that idea. Um, all right, so my last off, off topic, and then I will open up for questions for everybody else. I'm a huge fan of the actor studio. I don't know if anybody ever got to watch that. Um, it's fascinating. But to close out his interviews, James Lipton, the, um, the host of that show, used to ask what's called the Proust Questionnaire. Okay. So I'm going to put you through the Proust Questionnaire. All right. All right. No, so, yeah, this is. <clears throat> no. No. What is your favorite word? I generally, I, I've been asked this before, I usually default to defenestration. Not for a particularly good word, but I just love that we have, for any good reason, but I love that we have a word for chucking someone or something out of the window. <laughs> Does everybody need better? And actually, what's even better is uh, the, the city of Prague. I can't remember if it's two or three, but there are incidents in Prague's history that are the first defenestration of Prague, the second defenestration of Prague, because they have a history of chucking people out of windows in that city. <laughs> <laughs> Like music is like 
movement in my head, and I feel there's a world in which I turn that into a choreography career. Which, which profession would you avoid? Lots of them. <laughs> uh, really, anything that involves just kind of doing the same thing forever, because my life trajectory of like, I was in college, I was in graduate school, now I'm writing. I mean, I'm always writing something, but it's a different story on a regular basis. And so any job, like, I'm very badly an activist is going to monotony. I have never developed, like, the mindset that deals with it. So anything where it's just keep doing this every day for the next 10 years, same thing, I feel too bad. What's your favorite first word? Oh, you guys seem like, what's my favorite word? And I'm like, well, they're all great in different places. Um, uh, I mean, I'll admit that I guess I'll just go with the, uh, you know, all of our first words kind of come from like Anglo Saxon, so there's a certain sound we expect from our first words, and I, I guess I already you know, offended any sensitive ears in the audience with the reading, but fuck has a nice, like, you sink your teeth in at the beginning, it's got a sharp sound at the end. It is, it is a gratifying word to say when you need it. Pretty good for recognition. All right, that's, that's also like every part of speech you want to be, but. <laughs> If heaven exists, what do you, um, what do you, what would you like to hear God say at first date? Um, oh, you have all your favorite books to read. <laughs> Score. <laughs> your house is not gold and shiny as a library. Yeah, yeah, pretty much. I mean, when we were uh, looking for an apartment when we moved out to California, my sister asked if they rented any places that were just like bookshelves with a roof on top. <laughs> <laughs> Somebody needs to get on that. Yep. All right, so it is time for questions from the audience, if you would not mind. We have a microphone over here so we can hear you. So if you will line up behind the microphone, if you have questions, we will take those. Do not be shy. I'm willing to answer questions about pretty much anything. I will not promise all the answers will be honest, but I write my story to you. <laughs> So, um, so is the microphone on? Uh, I'm not sure if it is, but also that's the video. Hello? Can you hear me? Hello? I don't think that is what you, there might be a switch on the phone. Jarvis, can you check it? It might have been turned off after I, uh, ah, there we go. Anyway, I'll just, I'll just speak really loud. So, um, yeah, when I was young, like a lot of us, like, fantasy nerds, I was, like, obsessed with dragons. Mm -hmm. And I'm just curious, what do you think it is, like, about dragons? Out of all the mythical creatures, out of chimeras and griffins and golems, out of all, like, the fantasy creatures that come from different mythologies, why dragons? Like, why dragons? What's yeah. the what's the thing that makes so many people, adults and kids alike, just obsessed with dragons? Um, I think there's several factors in there, and one uh, I think this came up when I was on the Cryptids panel. They're a very flexible concept. There's a wide range of things that we're willing to put under the label of dragon. So for starters, you can kind of get many different kinds of flavor out of your dragons, and that makes them appeal to a broader range. Um, we also have a, a natural tendency to like things that fly, which not all dragons do, but, you know, um, I'm certainly one of the people who read Fern at an early age, and just the vision of, like, flying on the back of a very own dragon is hard to say none of that. Um, and so, you know, I think the, the power of that, and uh, it's interesting how we've evolved from being, like, kind of the epitome of scary threat, to then being something that we imagine ourselves in partnership with and being able to, like, you know, uh, enjoy their power for our own. Uh, so basically, I don't think there's a single answer. I think it's a whole constellation of stuff that all happen to come together under the label dragon, and other things don't have quite the same range. Thank you. Side note on you, same thing right wise for a living. Um, I learned in my English literature class in a defense of poesy that fiction is not lies because it does not 
presume to tell the truth in the first place. Oh, yeah. <laughs> but it's probably not my <laughs> This reminded me of that. Uh, but yeah, what is your uh, writing tool of choice? Is it by hand, typing? We uh, talked about typing associated with nine when my family got our first computer. Um, and this is, I, I will say, like my family were fairly early adopters with computers because both of my parents worked with them. Uh, and I am 40 now, so nine was you know, a while ago. And the computer that we had ran a word processing program called Word Perfect. It did this in days before Windows. We're talking, I'm going in for my lost time here to use Word Perfect. And I still use it now, my God, but you will take that away from me about 10 years after the program is done and stop being supported. Um, I, I hate Word so much. Uh, and so Word Perfect is just, it's a program I've literally been using for, for years now. I know my way around it. And, um, you know, I will use other things occasionally, like uh, Turning Breakfast in the Light, the standalone book that follows the memoirs. I wrote that one in Scrivener because I, I tried writing a novel in Scrivener before. I was like, this is fine, but I don't need all this bells and whistles. For that book, I need the bells and whistles. Because I had to be able to track kind of the alternation of the different types of things I was into, like diary entries and letters and newspaper clippings and sections of the myth they're translating. I needed to be able to track kind of how those were being interleaved. I needed to track the timeline of how fast things were going. So much crap I had to keep track of. And so I needed server to make that one go. But mostly, more perfect. And I feel like usually write a little bit long hand, but not much because my hand usually just can't keep up with it. And I have to go to typing things so it's not. So. Thank you. You mentioned that. Um, the, the biology of dragons was kind of outside of your expertise. Uh, can you talk about, I guess, the process of figuring that out, researching it, and writing that? So the biology of my dragons was um, a combination of some serious hand like the whole, oh, dragon mode is basically this like miracle on obtaining a kind of stuff that's that, which you know, keeps just making stuff up. Um, but a lot of it, I also did look to real animals. Like my usual example for this is the savanna snakes that they see in Mariande, which is kind of like the West African area. Um, that was something where, uh, if you look at what I say about like how they hunt and things like that, they are cheetahs. They are cheetahs with wings and spitting at it. Like that's <laughs> really what they come down to. Um, the uh, some things that was like based on uh, uh, the the great flies. Um, Microraptor, which is a, a dinosaur, um, probably didn't quite have like four distinct wings. It was probably a little bit more flying skull like and the, the two wings were sort of going together. But I came across the reference to Microraptor, and I'm like, four wings! I got the physical. There are other things that I, I know I drew from looking at what we think we know about dinosaurs and such. Uh, so yeah, I think it's heavily on real biology to make stuff feel real. And doing a lot of research into just like the natural environment and what could I figure out about that. So I noticed earlier when you were reading that you gave some of your characters uh, accents, mm -hmm. uh, specifically like a Russian accent, and I wondered if when you choose like an audio narrator, or if that's, is that how you think about the character? Like is that how the character sounded in your head when you wrote it down? And is that an important thing when you're selecting someone to read your book? Yeah, yeah. Um, so this has evolved a little bit over time. We uh, really needed that aspect. Um, really started for the most part with the four box for book because I decided I wanted to challenge myself with like character voices and making them more distinct. Which is why the two main characters in that novel, one is a cockney and the other is an Irish one. Mm -hmm. And I went digging into like what are not just the pronunciation, you don't want to like try to spell that all out on the page, it gets really bad really fast. Mm -hmm. um, but like what are the grammatical features and word choices that kind of go with that? Which is a funny joke. The first time I was getting to water anywhere, I go to Cyrus and I'm like, okay, I'm going to read from a thing who's so young. Um, <laughs> and if I read all this carefully crafted dialogue in an American accent, it's going to sound weird. Um, at that point, I can actually do like the same pronunciation of British pretty well. Like, so when I read from the memoirs, that's the accent that I use for the whole thing. Um, but switching in and out of RP to, I had to pick my poison coffee or Irish, which wasn't going to do. <laughs> I ended up choosing coffee, it, it went okay, uh, but that was definitely good reading on Marco. Um, but then from that book, I definitely paid more attention to that. Uh, so in the early time, I definitely tried to make her sound British, so there's going to be places where I tripped up because I'm not. Um, and with the, then getting to the, the audio narrator thing, obviously I had to find somebody who would be able to do that accent. But I, 
for those books, my publisher just said, hey, we got Kate Redding, which I thought that was the perfect choice. Yeah, yeah um, absolutely. The Master of Mirrors is the first time I've actually been given like audition clips from narrators and asked to choose one. And that is a tough one for the narrator because they've got to be able to, again, receive pronunciation in British because Ren's main con is pretending to be the Mount of your Outlaws from the country of Paris. So she's supposed to be foreign and she's supposed to be like really elegantly classy foreign, so we associate that kind of thing with that British accent. Uh, but all of a sudden, we needed to sound Slavic, test basically sounds Irish. We needed somebody who would have this like range of, of voices and accents. And so, yeah, when we got the audition clips, it was interesting to have the discussions on the list because there were like two that we go through now, not that one. And then there were people who were like, okay, well, you know, this one, I felt it Ren's voice better. And I was like, yeah, but this one did Tessa's voice better because Ren's more my character than I, and Tessa's more Alyssa's character, right? So we both had very clear notions of what they needed to sound like. Um, so yeah, that, that was very much consideration when choosing the narrative. Any other questions? Yeah, I'm just curious. So what are your favorite and least favorite things about collaborating with another author versus writing by yourself? Um, that's, that's, we've been asked that question a couple of times in interviews, and it's honestly hard to choose the least favorite thing about collaborating because it has worked out really well for us. Um, I, you know, I'm not going to say that it is always sunshine and roses, but then again, neither is writing novel on their own. Uh, so, like, there are small places where it's an issue, like when it comes time to do the copy edits for the book, I have the best time to do them as usual because both of us want to go through the manuscript. So basically, Alyssa needs to do it, and I need to do it, and that means we each get less time. Um, but the favorite thing, honestly, um, because like, the most important thing in collaboration is picking the right person to work with, somebody that you really gel with really well, and because we've got that, the way that we're able to keep each other's energy up, like, there's always this feeling of, oh, and I wrote this bit, and now we write it, and we go back, and we're switching back and forth during the course of the year, it's team just like, you know, talking to each other. And so there's a lot of these, yeah, not only am I pleased with this one, I'm going to get to see a list reaction. Awesome. Uh, we leave like marginal comments for each other and off, which uh, for the master viewers, I actually want to find a way to put it up on our website, like some of the choice of comments being left for each other. <laughs> so you can get, you know, the author's like comic kind of track, basically. Um, and then, uh, you know, places where it's like, uh, I don't know what to do with this. Uh, it, like, it helps to have somebody else, like, oh, this might have an idea, and even if that's not what we go with, it helps get them all rolling, and so it just makes it easier to get over that hump when you're on something you're like, oh, I don't know what to do with this. Uh, so that's really been amazing. And, and maybe just as a follow-up question, what made you guys decide to use a, a joint pen name instead of have your individual names on the book? Uh, that's when the publisher requested, but we had a suspicion that they were going to request it just because it kind of makes things easier on a marketing uh, standpoint. There is the downside that, you know, not everybody who knows my work is very bread and realizes that any character is also me. Um, but it means that, like, for example, I published books already, Alyssa's published books already, but we were a debut novel, you know, at the beginning of this year. So they get to use that angle in terms of marketing, which can help a lot. Um, and so, this is a brief background on the name. Uh, we, we knew that we might be asked this, so we thought we should have a name ready in case they do. And I thought, well, James, I think Corey's a collaboration. How did they choose that name? And I go, look, okay, and well, one of them, their middle name is James, and the other one, their middle name is Corey. The other essay comes from the initials of, I don't know, whose daughters, but some of our daughters. And so I was like, okay, so these are their middle names. We would be Marie Marie. That's not going to work. Marie is my middle name. Uh, but Alyssa and I met at an archaeological field school that was in Wales and Ireland. The part of Wales, we were at a place called Castel Hentes. Castel literally, literally means castle. That seems a little too long in Wales for quite fancy. Hentes, you can't quite hear it for like this of the, uh, the mass, but there's a lot of double L in the middle of that. So like we would constantly be trying to pronounce that right, and that's, you know, that's not even that. But the part that was in Ireland was in the town of Carrick and Cross. And so I was like, shot that down to Carrick. And then Alyssa pointed out to me, I'm just going to read for a list, and Carrick, Ma, Cross, so M.A. Carrick is a cross between M and A. I'm like, okay, uh, well, I really hope our culture likes that because we are both set now. <laughs> <laughs> Great, thank you so much. Okay. So, 
What is your worst like writer's block moment in writing your like writing a book or like a series that you've had, and how do you get past it? Uh, honestly, you see the worst one. I don't have an answer how to get past it. It's still um, <laughs> um, one of the one of the series that I've got out there. This is why I've done Blue Book Cafe, Cafe, uh, Wilder's uh, Urban Fantasy Trilogy. And I, um, I wrote the first book uh, many years past time, but I haven't published it. It takes forever. I wrote the second book. I knew some of what happened with the third book, but not all of it yet. And I have not yet solidified that enough, which, if you're wondering why that series isn't complete yet, that is why. And it's just so unfortunate because I've been putting this out through Book Food Cafe rather than through a contract with the publisher. I'm not, like, you know, in violation of the contract for not having finished it. Uh, except in so far as I do want my readers to get the ending of that series, I need to figure out the rest of it. Um, yeah. And I would say the other kind of doubt that I've had, I get back up to what you say, I really don't like the term writer's block uh, because I don't think it's helpful. It describes a like symptom, not actually a cause. And it means that you don't dig through and say, all right, why am I having problems? Because why you're having problems can be anything from I'm feeling lazy and I'm not playing this video game to I've taken a long term in the plot and I need to, you know, rip that out. Or maybe I just haven't thought through the next bit of plot better. To I'm under massive stress in my life because I just moved across the country and I have no energy to spare for this, or I have a diagnosed major depression. These all have different solutions. I try to apply the solution from one to a different thing, and it's not going to help. Having said that, if I were to apply to use the term writer's block, I actually would apply it to myself in the first several months of this year. Uh, I wrote a huge amount in 2020. I was one of the people, like, a lot of writers couldn't write at all in 2020. I was the camp that went, La la la, can ignore the world, escape into the fiction, cool, wrote a huge amount, hit 2020, and got stuck. And I had a period of several months where I thought, well, maybe I'll see if take it easy. I worked hard last year, all the last for a while. Still not doing anything. Okay. And for that, what I had to do was kind of go digging and say, all right, what's the problem here? Um, Started doing things like trying to get myself outdoors more often, like get more sunlight, get more fresh air, uh, start taking vitamin D supplements. Um, it was also paired with uh, there's a novel out that's going to be coming out in an anthology which tells the origins of the rook of Book of Rose. And I almost missed an end line because I was stuck on that story. That also had a bit of the, well, the problem was I couldn't figure out my way around the plot for her. And so for that, I, this is something I wrote on my own, not with the list, but I got to the list and I'm like, oh, <laughs> and then we figure out how to get uh, that story completed. So it was, you know, a whole combination of factors. Um, and that's kind of my good advice for like, how do you get past writer's block? Set that kind of side and ask yourself, what is going on here? What's the actual problem? Is it a problem in the story? Is it a problem in my personal life? Where is the issue? Am I physically sick right now? Or tired out with the flu or something? Uh, look for that and then figure out what the solution that is. I think maybe I'll have one more if anybody's got questions. No? No questions in the room. Okay, so what question did we not ask that you wish you had? Uh, most of us sort of startled, but I guess, you know, we're all kind of keeping our distance from each other, but nobody has yet noticed the ring that I wear on my right hand, and I thought of all the places that I go. In fact, I'm wearing a serpent biting its tail, you know, here. <laughs> Somebody surely should help us. That. Uh, my sister and I actually both wear, well, she's not my sister, she's my best friend. Um, we both have wearing basically wearing sort of wearing since high school because we were giant little fibers at the time. Yeah. What about John Marie? <laughs> yeah. So, Marie is my favorite color, you might have noticed by, you know, putting the same She's a brown. But, yeah. <laughs> I mean, I've got a black color in the corner, you know, maybe an argument for battle lines, but let's make some I, I cannot talk about all the research that I did and all this stuff and not say I'm brown. I think everybody in this con is a brown. <laughs> Some <laughs> Yeah. We just we just wear twins of the same thing. Right? Yeah. Uh, I'm green. Well, I'll take the next one. <laughs> According to the internet, I'm a gray, but. Yeah. They tried to tell me I was white. Oh no. <laughs> <laughs> I'll, I'll be honest, if, if I ever, I've got a concept for a tabletop role playing game I want to run. I'm uh, not using the actual real time system because it's such a bad match for the material. Um, so I've got a hack for a uh, new role of Darkest Mage that I use for it. Uh, but honestly, if I run that, I'm actually going to read it to be honest. I'm going to get rid of the lights. 
I basically think that there's nothing in the white lab that isn't adequately covered by brown and gray, and it's weird to me that in the white tower there's also a white plasma, so I would uh, replace it with something else. Mm -hmm. Yeah. <laughs> <laughs> All right, so with that, we are back.